This is uh, uh, our podcast. We're back on after uh, a break of, you know, and really a break of a, almost two years. Uh, we did revisit this about a year and a few months ago and had a, had a couple of podcasts while I was running for governor. Um, but overall, you know, we haven't really done it consistently for almost two years now. And uh, we, we, we're going to talk, we've talked about that in, this, in the uh, version before the, the, the episode before this. But the goal now is to build this podcast on, on, on basically uh, some of the best minds I can find in leadership, in business and in, in, uh, in government. So my goal is to find, we're, we're going to call us from here on Ditch Digger CEO Patriot Series. And it's Patriot Series because I'm not going to have any, any leaders, CEOs, business builders on this show, on this podcast in the future that don't love our country, that don't, that, that, that don't want to fight for this, this free market freedom, freedom that we're so used to, right? And so it's a, a combination of entrepreneurs, visionaries, uh, people that built something substantial, and then patriots, people that have fought for this country, people that, that have helped us protect this country. Um, in this case, I've got somebody that's done, done, done both. Got somebody that's been, a, 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 he's, a, he's a hero in my eyes, and he always will be the rest of my life, and he should be in all of our, all of our eyes, uh, a, patriot, a strong patriot, as well as a strong business mind. Uh, nowadays, on my board, at my executive board of advisors, uh, because I respect his business mind as much as his leadership in, in all aspects of life. So welcome, my buddy, Ge Major General John Borley. Gary, it's great to be with you here at Raybine Group. And uh, you throw a lot of verbal thunderbolts my way. I, I got to work hard now to live up to them. Uh, the only thing I'd take exception to, the hero, that's a big word. I, I'm grateful that you would be so generous with your terminology, but that's... That's well, not a mantle I wear easily. I, I've, I've served with some and stood in the shadow of a number. Uh, I'm one of many guys who spent a lot of time in the service, proud of that service, uh, proud that you are undertaking this patriotic business person, ditch digger uh, podcast and uh, honored that you think I was worthy to be on with you. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I only have a... I've got, I've got heroes in my life. I can count on in one hand, I think, you know, and, and, and I know thousands of people. So that I, I don't, I don't say this lightly when I say you're one of my heroes. Okay. I'll and, try to and, live up to that. And, that and generous. You, you, you already have, uh, you, have to, you have to do anything you already have. And you continue <coughs> to as you help and serve on our board and lead our businesses with me. So um, all that's, all that's there. and will always be there. We had an interesting Appreciate time back at the East coast, didn't we? Meeting the fellows for the Good Atlantic paving and the, uh, I, I thought that was the way you connected with, you talk about leadership. Uh, here's a couple of guys who are working a striping machine. Uh, I don't think you hadn't met them before no. and you spent a lot of time with them. And boy, were they impressed. Well, that, so that was our, our business, <clears throat> uh, Ray by Mid Atlantic. We, uh, we, we actually were at a, an outing out in Annapolis where, um, where my buddy here was a, a speaker there along with some other great Americans. And uh, so we visited one of my companies out there called Rabine Mid Atlantic, and, and where Scott Donaldson leads, he's our, my partner who leads that company, and a couple of a couple of people from the field came in, the striping striping yeah. uh, uh, teammates of ours from the field came in, and we had a great time. The fighter that. pilot kind of machine. I mean, it had more yeah. buttons and things on it. You know, you'd have to get checked out before you'd be able to get that thing off the yeah, ground. A, stri a striping machine. It's pretty complex <laughs> for sure, compared to the two by four and the and the four inch roller. Uh, the, the roller that I used to use yeah. striping back in the day. Okay. But either way, these young men were amazing. They're, they're, they're passionate about their jobs. They, they were, were, they yeah. were, they were amazing to talk to. We had a lot of fun. But that's them. again, I think because the attitude that you created through the, the value system, uh, in the great buying group companies. Yeah, no, we, we have a lot of fun. We, we, we our core values are, are, we, we, we take very seriously as you've seen, um, and, and our teammates really, exude the core values that we believe are so important, right? So Well, I, 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 in fact, I think they're so good that I've stolen them. Yeah, right. uh, and, you know, because I'm setting up this new company called Stargate. Yeah. And uh, Okay, yeah, there we go. So, so my, my buddy who uh, is, we're going to go into his history as, as a uh, prisoner of war, uh, major general in the military, all that, but, but go, this is part of his entrepreneurial um, 
fabric. So talk, talk about Stargate. Really. Well, Stargate uh, is a visionary company where we intend to uh, do one thing, and that's solve the problem of pain in commercial air travel. Yeah. <laughs> and you ask me where, you know, it's kind of like, when you're, well, where's the pain? You know, your mother asking you that. And it's everywhere. It's from getting to the airport. It's from processing through. It's the Disney-like lines. It's the, the ground delays, both arriving and on and on and on. Yeah. So we're going to set up for the business traveler and the frequent flyer uh, a transit shuttle, if you will, executive air, private air in its quality shuttle uh, between busiest cities. And it's going to uh, be, we think, it's going uh, trans- to transform. It, it transform will transform. Business business There's 17 travel. million business travelers. And we're looking to, from a membership standpoint, to garner about 1% of that uh, over about a six year period and, and, and provide unparalleled curated uh, ground and air. Okay, travel. so so this guy's uh, you know he's used to fast travel. He a, a, a fighter jet I'm pilot. A fighter pilot. Yeah, yeah. He, he doesn't go slow anywhere. Okay, still today he, he doesn't move slow. And, and and good luck keeping up with him on a golf course or anything else you do with this guy. But okay, so tell us how are you going to make it more efficient and faster than normal travel? Besides the delays and all the waiting and all it that was, kind of stuff. It, it was Thoreau who suggested and. If you've, if you've neglected your Thoreau, you ought to re-read, re-read chapter three, where I live and what I live for in Walden. And he makes a comment that how do you waste time without injuring eternity? And, you know, there's three most useless things in the world. Can we talk about useless things? Of course. You know what they are in the Air Force? It's runway behind you, altitude above you, and one second ago. Now think about it, the runway behind you, all the choices that you've made in your life to this point, stacking you down the runway and uh, the choices that you will make and the time that God has allowed us will be that runway in front of you. And uh, I like to think that it stretches on a goodly distance uh, and and there's lots of other things that one can do in one's life uh, for self, for family, for community, for state and nation. So that's kind of the useless thing that really is very useful to think about. And as you get older, you're really in a hurry. As time becomes ever more pressing on you. But before I talk about that one second ago, I want to talk about energy. You know, if you have a, a viewpoint of being on high, think of yourself on a balcony overlooking a swirling dance floor. That perspective is enormously useful. You need it in business. You need it in life. You need to be able to sort it all out. But in order to do that, you need to elevate, in my view, yourself above all of that. Sir. That's also where you get energy, gravity, God's G, we used to call it in the fighter pilot, where you can take advantage of that as you're maneuvering your jet. Going downhill, you've got a, a lot more see, than just what the airplane has itself and going against it. Eventually, you know, you run out of airspeed and idea. But the real factor about energy, no one follows a tired leader. No one follows a tired leader or manager. So you've got to have that, that uh, positivism to go back to our discussion of uh, Daniel Brandon, Nathan, and, and Hill, right? Because that's the stuff that that makes everybody want to gravitate to common goals and objectives. And then on time, on one second ago, of course, that's when everything. <laughs> See, I only had that second back, you know, but we fight for time because uh, uh, it, it, in a crisis, especially, or just day in, day out, you're always looking for that which is the most dear, most prized. And, like you, like me, I go to bed at night thinking of the things I could have done. Uh, wake up in the morning already thinking about the things I've got to do. Yeah. And the list just keeps going on and on. That's sure. And, and think, about, think about what you just said, uh, General. Think about the fact that you know, we're, we're all, as we, as we get older, right, time should be a precious, precious commodity no matter how old we are. 
So we're, so we're valuing time at, at the highest value of anything we can because life is short, as we know, um, and, and how we inspire others to accomplish our goals or you know, the, the, what we hope are, are admirable goals, whether it be in, in family or, 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 or government All or, the stuff. or business, right? How we inspire and we're others. Coming in, we're trying to make choices now in an election to say, who's going to, who's going to take our city, state, nation uh, in the right direction? And again, what we but what we lack, in my opinion, leadership in that realm as governors and presidents is inspirational leadership that inspires us all to go beyond what we would think we could go otherwise without their leadership. Right? Great leaders inspire others to do things that that are are, are beyond their own beliefs. Right? Yeah, I make a speech to corporate folks. You've never heard it, uh, other than abbreviated fashion, but talks about the eight virtues of leadership, and it's a pretty major. Uh, presentation because I think I think leadership is a virtue, uh, but it's composed of other virtues that are supporting to it. Uh, and for the purposes of our conversation, you know, a lot of people talk about leadership and they throw out the term and as if everybody knows what it is. <clears throat> I think it's deserving of definition. May I? Sure, let's hear it. I, I have mine too. I want to hear yours first. All right. Well, uh, all right. Leadership in my view, is a process of example. You got to be able to do it. You got to be able to show it. You got to do what you, you know, you got to lead by example. Of example and persuasion. Let me say it again. Leadership is a process of, of example and persuasion by which the leader or the leadership group, more likely, agrees to pursue uh, agreed goals and objectives difference between goals and objectives. Objectives are things like in the military, hills you got to take. Hills you got to take. The goal is more like the battle, the overall battle. And then you have to certainly pick your theater of operation. So those are the strategic areas of opportunity. Uh, and on top of that sits the overall mission to win the war. And the vision would be to certainly help contribute to a better world. And now we've got the better world. We've got the mission to win the war. We know we have to focus in certain strategic areas of opportunity, theaters of war, if you will, in order to win the battle. But the battle can last a long time. And you take it a hill at a time. Love it. Does that make it? Yeah, I like it. Yeah, I, I simply say <clears throat> leaders... To be a leader, you must inspire others to do more than they would ever be able to do without you. That's it. I mean, for me, I, it, that's, that's a level of effort, but I think it needs to have purpose. It's all part of it. If you have, if you have purpose, you better have, you better be able to accomplish things that 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 you would never imagine you could accomplish. You know, by the inspiration of that leader. Starting this new business, we've, we've taken a lot of time, as we always do when we crank up something new, to focus after we get through some value propositions, to focus on, you know, what the hell is it we want to do? You know? <laughs> you know? And, yeah. and, you know, what are those the key elements, especially the, the question that every manager leader that I know asks himself repetitively in the course of the day. You know what that question is? What do I do next? Yeah. <laughs> but rather than taking it out of the end basket, you know, there's some choices involved here on how to, get bang for the buck for the investment of time. Well, anyway, those are some thoughts. Well, I tell you, you know, when, when I think about you, I think, I think about, uh, you know, the thing that comes up always, questions are going to come up when I hear people, you know, people ask about you or you talk in front of groups of people. You know, they, they want they want to hear your, you know, your, your version of what it was like to live six and a half years, over six and a half years in a, in a prisoner of war camp. How, how, you there, know, you know, there how, is, how did you get through that? Because you had to There, there somehow, is a fascination after all these years with that subject. And I, as, as much as Myrna, my wife for 59 years now, you know, the one who, the one who hung in there when I was gone, didn't even know I was alive for many years. Amazing. Uh, she's, she's an amazing woman. She is an amazing woman. Yeah, y'all you kicked your coverage there. Uh, she's, she's still- uh, No, I don't think so. I think, uh, I, no. I think, I think we're deserving one of the other. <laughs> <laughs> Although on a given day, you're right. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> you don't get your coverage. She's, she's awesome. Well, anyway, but the, the, 
serious point is that we tried hard to, after that break-in period, coming back after all that time, uh, where where people thought it was all about survival, and it was, but it was more about survival with honor. We wanted you to be proud of us. We wanted my wife, a little girl, to be proud of daddy. A daddy she didn't know. I was just a picture of Betty Dustin. She was three months old when I left. And she was seven and a half when I came back. And she's more like me today. And the one we had after the war is more like her mother. So go figure that out. But uh, uh, Gary, the... How do you capture all that time in words, uh, in imagery? And it goes back to the time thing, but I would, I would suggest that the months and the years went by kind of quickly. The days came up. Every day is a particular amount. Because we were, uh, especially in the early days, living under a very brutal regime, circumstance, confined, uh, either alone uh, for a long period of time, or at best in semi-isolation. No ventilation, no windows, no books, no stimulation, other than <clears throat> our ability risking physical punishment tap on the walls with the code that we use to communicate for purposes of sanity, purposes of chain of command purposes, which was outlawed as well, but we used it anyway, uh, for keeping the faith with your fellows and uh, hanging on. So, so, so that's that's probably a lot of words. Uh, so you're very difficult. So your, your book's an awesome book, and, and uh, I, oh, I, I, I didn't realize you're a poet, but uh, to read and I understand, I, I realize you're quite the poet too. So, so any, well, can any, I anybody, talk about that book? Yeah, but anybody out there's got to get this book. It's an awesome book about your your story. And uh, oh, I see you've got a copy of it. I've got a copy now. right there. It's, taps on the wall. Yeah, well, it taps on the walls. Talks about the tap code. That it's in, it's in the book, and and you can see it here. Did you get a chance to look yeah, at it? Yeah. So you know it. So the next time you get thrown in jail, you'll be able to talk to the guy next to you. Is yeah, that right? Yeah, that's absolutely. <laughs> uh, and that John, code, John yeah. McCain was good enough to write the forward. But I, I wrote this book in my mind. Uh, I wrote all the poetry kept it memorized all those years and added to it and, and then kept it through all so my wife and little girl would have legacy in case I didn't make it. Well, I made it. And buried the book for 40 years. Uh, I put it on tape recorder. It was funny, I, I'm still in a bathroom. We're at Clark Air Force Base, February 12, 1973, before the time that many of you were born or perhaps even thought of. Uh, or out there, but uh, and I've been carrying these poems in my head all these years, you know, a whole book. So we ran over to the BX or the base exchange on, in uh, bathroom, uh, and I asked the guy, the base exchange manager, I said, I need a tape recorder because I wanted to download this content. Download was not even a verb. In 1973. And he he comes back, he's got this shoebox looking thing. And I said, no, no, I want tapes with, you know, reels and things like that, uh, Kai or Canberg or something like that. And the guy laughs and said, this is a tape recorder. He said, and hands me a cassette recorder. So this is future shock. I have no idea what this thing is. Uh, but, uh, and I didn't have any money either. Uh, but the guy just gave it to me. So I, but over late, later, we got a few. Where was this at? 1973. Where 1973, was Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines. Okay. And I haven't even talked to Murmy on the phone. I'm over in the VX getting a, getting, and it's hard to do that, you know. But they've got. So this is when you first got out. Oh, this is within the first 20 minutes of 
landing at, at Clark Field, and they put us in the bus and took us to the hospital. They were going to, you know, deworm us and be this and be that. And, uh, and so I put the, I had my bathrobe on, and snuck out the door, and hitched a ride over to the BX uh, and got to the state recorder, and then went back. And that afternoon, uh, started to download, say, the content of that, and then uh, had it transcribed later, but buried the book for 40 years until 40 years. I didn't want to talk about it. Didn't want, you know, there's some stuff in there that's pretty yeah. rough. Uh, and John McCain and others came to me. And this is the first imprint of the Pritzker Military Library. Well, having pitched everybody that, and there's four parts to it, a flying part, uh, POW, human nature, Cuts feathers and all there. Uh, then there's a thing of uh, the holidays, the Christmas and Thanksgiving coming up. And when I was, when the family comes over and you know invades the house, and you find out after about twenty minutes that of all your relatives, there you, you really like yourself the best. But the uh, <laughs> uh, and then a long epic poem where it deals with all manner of human. Emotions and motivations. It's called Sea Story, Southeast Asia Story. Uh, and there's a long glossary in the back. So anyway, that's the that's the pitch on taps on the walls. This thing on the back, it's this cup I smuggled out. That, that cup, you see how it's bruised? Yeah. I can tell you how that got bruised like that. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, with anything handy. Uh, and then these bracelets with the bracelets that so many people wore. We found this out after the war that uh, to demonstrate solidarity. This is with our names on those bracelets. So I, this is in a museum now, and it's got a name. All these bracelets festooning out of this cup that has held, I can tell you, it has held everything that you might imagine. And then all these bracelets that were worn by wonderful Americans who were keeping our name alive. I call that my cup runneth over. Aww. My cup runneth over. That's awesome. So uh, anyway, so this book, if people want it, uh, they, they can get it on Amazon and stuff like that. But if you want it inscribed, then come to me at the JLB Viking. JLB Viking is my old fighter pilot call sign. JLB Viking at Yahoo.com and say, hey. And I'll say, hey, back. And for 25 bucks, I'll send you a copy of the book and nice. inscribe it and all that stuff. Well, I've got my copies and yes, a box, well, a box of more. I well, I know. We already give away as gifts. Well, no, I've already given a bunch of my leaders. <coughs> I think it's a great book for leaders to read. You know, and, and I've got a bunch of CEOs that we met and I mentor that are part of that run my comp our companies here, my partners and CEOs. And you know that the, these people are all striving to be great leaders. And boy, Read this is, is going to help them. Well, it's, there's a piece of that there, I would hope. You know, I would hope Absolutely. that there's an inspirational piece. And, uh, but in the end, you know, it's uh, you asked me about the six and a half years, and I will tell you that uh, you use shorthand, but the first shorthand would be the quit is to die. The quit. And so, what do you have to do? And you, you know, I use this phrase all the time. You got to pick them up and lay them down. You got to keep marching. And life will bring punishment and reward to us all. You know that. Mm -hmm. Personally, professionally. Pick it up. You try, you try, yeah, pick them up and lay them down. Just keep marching. And pretty soon, progress is made and whatever it was, you know, and a lot of it in life is people talk about the pursuit of happiness, and I'm convinced that there is a lot of happiness to be had, and I like to be happy. In fact, I reject stuff that would make most people unhappy. But that's just a technique to be able to deal with the instances of suffering that come to all of us in life, and it's how you deal with it, how you are resilient with your own stuff inside and I'm talking about great loss. Loss of a loved one. Uh, loss of finance. And 
different circumstances. It's loss of, of uh, friends. You're neglect, you're there. It's loss of, anyway, we, we keep bouncing. Uh, COVID is another thing. How do you deal with, with, with that? How do you have the punishments and rewards? And it's how you deal with the punishments that really think you make the individual. Because uh, that's how you test it. Yeah. So we were tested for six and a half years. And the idea was to come out and see if we could still compete. At least that was my, my shtick. I, uh, I, I finally did call Myrna that day after I got my tape recorder. And uh, I called her and on the phone and she said, oh, I'm so glad you're back, you know. She knew you were alive a couple she of years. Yeah, she knew I was alive for a couple of years. So but remember, years, I was but gone. For a few years, she didn't know you were alive. Yeah, for a couple of three years, she, she didn't know I was alive. Didn't even know he was alive. Yeah. Wow. And, uh, but, and she, oh, I'm glad you're back. But it sounded like I'd gone up for a pack of cigarettes. You know, and, uh, <laughs> she, uh, uh, so that was nice. And then the second question wasn't so nice. And she said, what are we going to do next? And I said, we're going back to fighters. We're going to go back to flying jet fighters. And I've got to, if I'm any good, if I can compete with the guys that have been out here all along, uh, we'll stay in. But I am not going to have to back up to the pay line. I'm not going to back up to the bar. Uh, so we'll be quite objective about that. And I'll get out and we'll do something else, whatever that something else is. So I tell you, uh, and I share with your adoring viewing public that of all the wonderful things that have happened to me over the subsequent years, uh, there was nothing more important than uh, getting back operational and being a top gun in the outfit. That meant more to me than anything. And then I got to fly and command and staff activity all over the world uh, wonderful airplanes, wonderful people, uh, important responsibilities. Uh, when, you know, frankly, everybody except Myrna and my wing commander told Myrna that if anyone was going to make it, John was going to make it. He told me later, I was just trying to make her feel good. I thought you were dead too. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, when guys would go down, uh, you know, because I had almost 100 missions and I volunteered for 100 more. Uh, we, you know, you inure yourself to that loss because you just raise your glass and say, he's a good guy, and there he is, and maybe say something a little fighter polish at the bar, and, uh, and, and you press on and go fly the next day or whatever it is and do your job. So uh, that, that was... That was uh, the guts of it. But what I told her of that on the phone, she said, are you sure you want to do that? That I'm not too sure I want you to do that. You know, she's not seen me for, well, it's going to be over seven years. And, and I said, it's something I have. There's this long pause. And she says, I'm with you. Wow. And she, Can you imagine the courage it took that lady? You know, you know, that's the first time she's heard my voice in seven years. She's going to be supportive of you going and back she, and she, and We're going to go back at the fight yeah, and do the stuff that, uh, you know, put their life. Now, I'm going to tell him, there's another guy on the call. He's a guy that we went through hell. So he's probably the only man I ever loved. I truly loved. Not in a physical sense, but in an emotional sense, because we were hurt so many times together, and we were either separated and put back together. This is in the early years. And uh, I don't want to mention his name. Uh, dead now, he died in an aircraft crash. We, we dreamed of flying fighters together, and we did. And 
and then he killed himself in a letter. In a while. But uh, this guy got on the phone with it, and he was listening in to Myrna. He knew Myrna as well as I knew Myrna because we shared stories back and forth, and I knew his wife. He's a prisoner war also. Yeah, he was a prisoner war with me. I, you know, we lived together in the hard times, and then we were split apart and we were back together. Anyway, we had this great experience together. And as I said, when we lived together, we, you know, you haven't got anything to do to tell stories. This guy's wife was nuts. He was dynamite, you know. In fact, I was making up stories about Myrna to compete with his wife. Anyway, so, so, he, so he's He's listening in with me talking to Mona. And then we called his wife. And, you know, this is, this, you know, I've got a lot of pets for God's sake. Yeah. I mean, there's stories, and I'm not going to relate it so that there's anonymity here. So we're listening on the, I'm listening on the phone with him, you know, sharing the, the receiver. So very similar situation. She didn't know he was alive for a few years. No, no, she no. did know, actually. She, she did know, yeah. and, and he was there for how long? <clears throat> Just about the same time I was. Okay. And the phone rings and she answers the phone and it's, oh, hi, I'm glad you're back. Kind of thing. And the second sentence was, I'm divorcing you. And I, and I caught it. Literally caught it. And the next thing I know, I'm on the phone <clears throat> talking to this woman I've never met, telling her this is a guy worth fighting for. Well, that story did not have a happy ending. Uh, so I come back to Myrna, and uh, and, it, and frankly, to the, my daughter Lauren, and to the and to my daughter Megan, who was born after the war, but. Uh, Talk about being wound around someone's little finger. Uh, I'm, I'm endlessly uh, committed to making sure that I'm paying them back for uh, such fidelity. Such fidelity. That's awesome. That's awesome. It's part of leadership and marriage. Mm-hmm. Tomorrow we'll tell you, and I'm the one demonstrating it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, so we it, it's a mutuality. So we think about all this stuff. I mean, so you, you went back to, to be a Top Gun pilot, and you, and you had to requalify for everything. And the fight, yeah, I had to go back and see if I could, you know, if, you could, if I could, if I could compete with the guys, and I could. And so we stayed in and had a great run for you know thirty seven years all in, uh, and lived as I say, fortunate to be all over the world and had some duty and lot lots of Washington duty. Including, as you know, at the White House, and, uh, uh, commanded things overseas in the states, and, and then transitioned late in life into the strategic air command and had additional responsibilities like commanding bombers and tankers and things through the SR 71 and the Black Fleet. Had uh, significant responsibility with respect to the execution of the nation's nuclear war plan. And for a while, was one of the three generals, excuse me, helped plan it. Wow. So I had, a, I had a guy come up to me once and say, you know, the, the, the guy was serious. He said, looked me in the eye and said, what if I threw the Queen of Hearts down? You know, the man sure in Canada thing. Because <laughs> you know, I've got all these clearances now, all these state secrets. And, uh, uh, what was that like? I mean, when you were, you were one of three. Picks. We were one of three. Uh, now, there's a lot of people creating it, but there were three flag officers who were affected. The lead was a joint strategic target planning staff. And there was, I was in charge of systems, operations, and analysis. Uh, another guy had the whole planning process, but then our job was to get inside of it and analyze the target structure and everything else. And then there was an admiral who sat on top of the whole thing. Uh, and that this is the, the time was briefly the president of the and uh, Secretary of Defense and the people that are on the call. The people think that there's some button that gets pushed. 
There's no button. Okay. So there's no box and a button you put. There's no say? box. There's no button. Yeah, like no. that. Uh, pardon me. No, it was like. It well, was, it, what happens is that when the warning systems, which are very complex, space based, uh, show that you're under attack, then the time of flight of the missile uh, is calculated, and you've got a finite period of time, plus twenty minutes. Uh, to get the Secretary of Defense and the President on the line and to have this quick confab about this is what we see. We are under attack. It's a massive attack. Or it's not. It's this. Or it's that. And uh, because of variations on the theme. It's not just push the button. And, 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 and you know the destination of the nuclear attack at that point? Did you, 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 in fact, uh, have a readout that comes that predicts where the where the where the impact points are going to be and the numbers of missiles and things. This is all space based. Uh, there's also a problem with what they call an EMP attack, which could blot out your electronics. But uh, things going along, the president uh, and the secretary of defense and uh, the head of now strategic range, the strategic air command, and be the operator. Uh, and the upper, and my operational guys are sitting there working through the calculus with the leadership. And when the decision is made to do something or nothing, uh, or something or nothing, uh, then it falls to the operators to make it happen. So it goes out to the bombers if they're on alert, and our bombers currently are not on alert. Uh, it goes out to Ships at sea. You mean our bombers not currently not? We do not. We used to keep bombers on nuclear alert uh, as recently as well before the Berlin Wall came down. But we don't currently have that posture. Uh, why would we tankers have... were on alert as well. And why did we eliminate that? Uh, because they didn't sense that the threat was there. But now, more than ever, in my opinion, the threat's there. Is there the threat, to be done the, now threat the threat, the threat, the threat. Uh, this talks to the DEF kind level of the defense condition level. And there is a point where airplanes are generated and bombed up, if you will, and tankers are put in position because you need airborne tankers to execute some of these missions. But you've also got the missiles in the holes in North Dakota and other places. And then you've got the ships at sea, the rumor submarines that are, quote, in the box. Uh, and so that's the components of your nuclear force. And those are the assets that you use. Now, if it's a whole lot of blue, which would be highly unlikely in my operational uh, assessment. Uh, although, if you get down to small numbers of weapons, then you can construct scenarios where first use becomes so there's, there's value in having lots on both sides of the planet, on all sides of the planet. It's just a guy who's just got a few. You know, nothing to, nothing to, uh, to do other than to have a spasmodic kind of reaction, uh, reaction that, that is worrisome. So uh, and the planning phase tries to take all that into account. Uh, but in the end, it's a complex procedure, heavily, heavily dependent upon authentications from the present man down. Uh, and yet, mindful of time, that, that this thing happens. So, so and it happens. Well, so on that subject, you look at, I, 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 I just know a little bit about history from what I, what yeah. I read, but Cuban, Cuban uh, Missile Crisis seemed like the time where we had the biggest threat of nuclear attack. Well, it, that, was, that was a, a tense time. Was, and that was the time when, when forces were on alert yep. and, and things were ratcheted up. That was even before your time. There was a, no, well, I was at the academy. I remember oh, yeah. it was at a football game and all of a sudden, a big football game uh, with a lot of the Air Force leadership there. And all of a sudden, the stands empty. This would be uh, 1962, of course, and uh, fall of 62. And and I, you know, really started on I think what October sixteenth, nineteen sixty, when the 
films were verified uh, by the president, and then over the next day was the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, uh, but it's interesting because uh, at least there was communication. They weren't doing the things from World War One, exchanging diplomatic notes. I mean, there was there was verbal communication as well as, as written communication, and I think that's important even now that when you have, uh, as we do with Ukraine uh, and with China and other things, that uh, that there be levels of communication that are maintained, just to make sure that uh, you try to stop events from controlling. And you want people to somehow stay in charge. Now, it may not change much, but at least if you've got that level of communication, because a lot of wars start by and conflicts start through misdirection, miscommunication in the long course of history. Well, you know, we were in we that here last week, and, and, and uh, great, some great leaders are there. And, well, and, we, uh, had the, we had a former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mike Mullen. We know? did. And, uh, and Tony Thomas. Tony Thomas, another great head of SOCON. Head of SOCON, right? And, and, and yet, uh, you know, you, were, you probably had got the most uh, accolades and people people stood up uh, standing ovation for you more than anybody else because of your service. But either way, these guys are great leaders as you are. They seem to have uh, more more worry about our, our time right now than, than what they would have had back then. I, I think it, I think it is way. concerning because of forced posture and... Uh, We've let our military become hollowed out in many respects in this, giving all of this to Ukraine it even makes our, our stockpile circumstance worse. But more than, more than that, it's attitudinal. And uh, I, I think much like the countries at the crossroads here in November, you know, but in truth, America is always at the crossroads. We are always in need of reinvention, renewal is a better phrase. And because there are always forces that are trying to say, oh, the grass is greener just if we could adopt a bigger government circumstance and if we could just, you know, take care of everybody and give everybody this. And give, uh, giving really, you, know, you can't give self-esteem. It's got to be earned. Absolutely. And and I think that this focus uh, on nobody does nobody wants unfairness to people nobody wants lack of respect to people but this focus on guilt trips and racial disparity what how 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 shallow judging people on the basis of skin color i mean that doesn't it's antithetical surely we've come as a nation well past Point when that was in fact a uh, dividing point. When the when the Lincoln Monument was inaugurated in 1922, with the Lincoln Monument is my favorite place in Washington. I was just there last week, especially at midnight. Yeah. When the Lincoln Monument was inaugurated in 1922, Chief Justice presided. Happened to be a guy by the name of Taft, who was an ex uh, who had his own special bathtub built, by the way. Yeah. That he was so large. But I guess they keep it in reserve for future use. Uh, uh, but anyway, the uh, and you looked out on the crowd, there was a photograph taken of the crowd from the dais, and the crowd, there's a big aisle that goes down the center. And it's so striking and it's so sad. But characteristic of the time. Because on the left, it was all white, and on the right, it was all black. So there was a segregation in the ceremony, at yeah. the ceremony, Crazy. when the Lincoln ceremony, yeah, when the Lincoln uh, memorial was inaugurated, and for the guy who you know, had the country thrust in yeah. the Civil War to keep the Union together. Kind of right. So, uh, We've come a long way, and I think we need to be mature as a people in the end. Mutual respect, mutual regard. Um, unless, you know, treated badly or unfairly, uh, then you get to you get to make adjustments. Yeah, but but uh, 
it's a uh, yeah, it's be, probably the issue of our time to be judged by the, the, the contents of your character. Well, that's the that's color part of your of, skin. That's right? Martin, Martin Luther it's, King's it's yeah. just a it's just an obvious thing that all good people should should be living right. And exactly. I think, I think yeah. most of us do. Unfortunately, um, we've got you know, leaders in government and otherwise that are, that are kind of pitting people against each other because of their color, difference in color, or the difference of sexual preference. Or well, it's crazy. You know, it's, it, it, you know, we're complex people, but I, I don't know how we make... You, you don't want sex, for example, to intrude into the workplace. Oh. Or, you know, it, it, that's a very private matter. It ought to be kind of private. You don't trot that out as some kind or, of... Or in front of our, our first, second, third grade kids that they should be learning. Oh, I you know. Instead of, uh, you know, math well, and look what science. Happened with, look what happened with our math scores. And, and it, that's an issue in this political campaign coming up. But that's far afield. It's part of leadership. I and mean, we look to, to, you know, to elect the right the right kind of people who will, who will think about the, their community, state, nation first before thinking about themselves. But human nature is, is as Franklin, I think, suggested that avarice and ambition are the two basic passions of mankind. So greed and power come into play. And, and we are imperfect human beings. And as close as we can come is in this American experiment and if, and if somehow we don't conserve it, if we don't renew it, we're the last great hope. You know, there are very few governments that have lasted. We're coming up on our 250th anniversary. Very few we're still so young. Yeah. Very so few. we need yeah. to have the freedom for more than 200 years. Well, we've always generated that somehow at some crucial time, the right combination of leaders, military, political. We'll see if we still got the right stuff. We'll be better. Yeah. Okay, so, so somebody, you know, look at all the awards you've got. What, what, what's meant the most? You got silver star. You got two bronze stars. You got two purple hearts. You've been a CEO and chairman of uh, of, of companies and board board executive advisor for companies like ours, right? All these things, all these accolades. What, what, what do you, you founded SOS, Service Over Self, right? Which is it's some, something where you advocate for. Well, it's a program that we can hopefully deal with the violence and deal with the dislocation of society where. You know, four out of five young Americans don't qualify for the all volunteer force. The military is still a respected institution. You'll, you'll learn a lot to grow up in it. And uh, so the, the premise is that we would be able to put uh, young people 18 to 25, actually all the way up to 30 uh, with a waiver, uh, into a small unit, 100 people, no more, platoons of 30, and basically a few more for 100. Uh, mixing ages because young men, young women are different as they migrate through the 18s, 20s. In fact, people say you're not mature until you're 25, which brings up another question. Why would you want immature Americans voting? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, the uh, But so anyway, you, you mix ages. You mix geography. You uh, mix socioeconomic background levels. Uh, so that America gets to meet America at a very age. You're saying one, because, one year. Well, would it be one year of service? Voluntary. Yeah. At this point, I, I'd prefer it with mandatory, but uh, voluntary. And only if it's requested by the service that they would have to forecast that I need this sort of, sort of person yeah. uh, to do that. And federal state agencies would be able to levy uh, this thing, but they'd be in the military. So they would be. Supporting and as well as supporting the Guard and Reserve Active, well, they would be supporting these other entities. And the, you know, just think if we need people to fight forest fires, if we need people on the border, mm -hmm. uh, if we need people patrolling the main streets, not that they would be cops, but they would be a presence sure. uh, to be able to offer exactly, be hopefully persuasive, but just presence provide uh, something that would mitigate against this crime scene that we're facing. And, and, and we need to understand that the criminality that seems to be gripping the country is driven in some 
regard, not only by drug use, but by the lawlessness that uh, is hard to contain unless there's presence. So, so, so where is it at right now? If, if well, we are, uh, I've just been called back, if you will, by the head of Selective Service to go back and talk about this program specifically. Uh, it needs legislation, and the Congress to this point has been medicine, it's been in committee, but it's never gotten out of committee to support it. We don't want to run it, we want the Department of Defense to sure. run it. Uh, but we're trying to shape the legislation and shape the political will to do this. Uh, if you could just have a little money you're going to throw away on the Green, green New Deal, yeah. you could have this program and it'd be up in space, and I think it, <clears throat> it'd do a lot for the young people because if you don't have your GED currently, you can't be in the Oval Office before sure. if you don't have your high school degree. Just, we'd make sure that they got their GED if they were in this. Just, I mean, in fact, service over self, but we, uh, we hire uh, veterans in our business yeah. as much as possible because we, we get amazing, amazing luck, with, or, you know, blessings, I would say. With, with service, service men and women being part of our businesses. Okay. What we find is for sure they understand you know, leadership, for sure they, they understand that they, they, they have a passion usually to serve our customers and each other. And when I say each other, we're very, we have to be a very safe environment, so they have to watch out for each other, right? And well, you do, but your safe, safety and grapevine group is one of the hallmarks. Number one, number one, we're around a lot of dangerous uh, equipment and all equipment. that. And, you know, we, you know, people die and, and get hurt on it in our industries, and we try to keep people safe every day. So it's got to be big. You've got a very enviable record here, I know, because I'm on your board. You do, but one of the best you, you'll ever find in our industry. And, and again, I believe that the, the service the service men and women that we hire that that, that, are, have, that are veterans add to that the value that you would hope so. Yeah. They, they, because they've been in an environment where they have to think about safety, right? More than, they have to think more, about their buddy. Normal, they have to think about their buddy. They've been in an environment where they where, where they've respected leadership. They've been in an environment where um, they're serving other people, and uh, we, we're here to serve our customers more than anybody else in the, better than anybody else in the country. That's our goal, yeah. and 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 these people do that well. So so this this service over self by itself, if one, if one year of service like this, in my opinion, can actually bring bring these people those values that they don't have currently. Well, it's it's all about, especially the, you know the, the cohort of that platoon or of that company of 100 small unit oil yeah. and they, they come out with something else but after a year they'll come out with an educational stipend over and above and within the pay is below what it is in the active duty thing and it's a year of service it's a seven day a week you're not working five days and then going downtown yeah. and you know running around and with your hair on fire you are in the military but what you get is you get that badge that you get to wear. Or this, you know, this thing says veteran. It's not a silver star or it's not a bronze star. Thing. It's just a red, white, and blue flag kind of thing that was created by a veteran. And it says veteran. And all of the time that I wear this, and it happened this morning, I came to Chicago this morning, uh, work on the business. And uh, <clears throat> in the elevator, and some guy, turns to me in the elevator and says, oh, he says, thanks for your service. And I said, you're very, thank you, you're very kind. And, and then the next phrase out of his mouth is, I wasn't in the military myself, but my uncle was, or my father was. And again, it's almost like it's a rite of passage for Americans to identify with veterans. And, you know, Veterans Day is coming. And uh, November 11th is... Uh, you know the history, the, I mean, the actual history of veterans that No. Tell me the lecture again? Yeah. In 1918, uh, November 11th at 11 o'clock, it went all quiet on the Western Front. This is the armistice of World War I, that terribly destructive war, the most, one of the most bloody enterprises ever. The actual treaty didn't get consummated until the next year at Versailles in the summer. And President Wilson, Woodrow Wilson, declared November 11th 
to be Armistice Day in 1919. And it was and has been observed as the 11th month, the 11th hour uh, ever since, with little exception. But it was never a law until 1938. So all those years passed and they became Armistice Day was then inaugurated uh, officially in the law of the land in 1938 until 1954 when Armistice Day was changed uh, to Veterans Day because World War II had involved and Korea had taken place. And so they, they substituted Veterans Day. And then uh, a few years later, there was this con combination of trying to take the various holidays and put them into a three-day weekend. Uh, Memorial Day, for example, was changed from the last day of, of May to the Monday following the last weekend, the fourth weekend in May. Other things were combined to keep the three day weekends, and they combined Veterans Day to put it basically back in October. And there was great uproar in the nation about this, and it never really got ratified until 1974-75 time frame. People were confused about when to do Veterans Day and they really wanted it on November 11th. And President Ford pushed through an executive order and then a rather change to the law that took Veterans Day and made it November 11th, 11th day, 11th hour. At which point we are supposed to observe two minutes of silence. For, uh, and that, that's, uh, that honors the veterans who uh, basically, uh, or the people lost in World War I, but the real purpose of Veterans Day now is to honor those serving and those who have served. It's kind of the we the living. There's about 20 million Americans right now. So there's no, if you think about the expanded American family, four, five, six, ten, almost every family has yeah. got, got a lineage of course. Course. Uh, And so that was what President Ford did. That was, you know, I worked in that way. Um, but the rest of the story is that it gets confused and people think it's when we enter our war debt and that's really Memorial Day. Veterans Day has the combination is kind of remembering World War One, uh, and that, but everything else is the veterans. So it, 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 there's a intermingling there that's important to that's respect and observe. So that's just a little lesson in history that's interesting that it, uh, that's important. it took till 30. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'll be speaking at a number of events in conjunction with Veterans Day. So when, you, when you think about leadership, you know, you know yeah. you've been through it all military wise. Uh, it, it, when, you, when you look at you know, family leadership in your family, you, you've been a leader in your family. Um, no, when I cross the threshold, when I cross the threshold, she's got the stick. All right, well, <laughs> along with Myrna, the yeah. assistant, uh, yeah. as the uh, leader of the family. But when, when you look at business, what, what do you, we talk a lot about business and building business. Yeah. So you're an entrepreneur, you're building a an amazing business that's going to be fun to fun to watch and maybe be part of myself. But when, when I think about these things, I look at what are the similarities you see in, in successful leadership in, in, in the military and, as well as business? What applies? I, 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 I think leadership, we were talking about this earlier, yeah. leadership has uh, a noble word associated with what I will call good leadership. Uh, and, and that is that it is a virtue. But it's made up of, in my judgment, eight, eight virtues. And once again, I find myself having to defend my own argument here. So let me do that. Uh, and and I, I start with the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, who were sensitive to the 
combination of qualities that made up a good person or a good nation state. And it was a combination of political virtue and military virtue and spiritual virtue, even in ancient Greece. And the four virtues are a sense of justice, fairness, uh, where, where people are treated in a manner that gives them opportunity for their own expression, but mindful of the expression of others, and, and that, that there is, again, this essential fairness, or especially under the laws, which every civilization is, there is equal application. But when you've got people in power who are treated differently than people who are citizens, if the leadership gets prerogatives that are seen as unfair, which is blemished. Uh, temperance is another one because you've got to be in control of yourself. I mean, if you can't control yourself, how can you ask to be in charge of, of others or? Just their support. And I'm talking here about the vices, I mean, sex drugs, booze, et cetera, anything that would blunt uh, me, et cetera. You've got to keep your, you've got to, you've got to keep a handle on uh, Aristotle's sake, the temperance in all things, or moderation in all things. And I'm not sure all things should be included either. I, I don't know how you moderate certain of these things. They, they talked to Mark Twain about that. He said, right. I can't moderate any of my vices. I can cut them off, but I can't, uh, can't moderate. But the whole thing is you're in control. Yeah. You're in control. Yeah. Uh, the third big one was courage. And I'm sure battlefield courage is important. But this is courage, more than that courage to do the right thing. And you say, well, how do you know what the right thing I tell you, you know what the right thing is because you know when you do something wrong. Uh, it's, you know, I don't have to spell it out for you. You know, mm -hmm. I know. I, I had a great mentor when I was in high school. I got the greatest honor I've ever had in my whole life from this guy. Much, much better than two purple hearts and the two bronze uh, stars. Uh, uh, that's. Uh, uh, that's pretty cool. Well, that, that's how I was like, proud of my decoration. Example of what high school, uh, what a high school teacher or teacher can do for a person's life, right? Well, I mean, right, right. I here. will tell you this: I was president of my class, and I gave a speech. It was a terrible speech. I read it, you know, nose down, reading really, because I was terrified. All these people out there at graduation. I had one ad lit line: "It said, tonight we go our separate ways. Uh, some never to meet again." When I did the fifty-year reunion for the class. I had people come up to me and say, you're wrong. Look, here we are. You know, we are meeting again. And uh, anyway, so I finished that speech and sat down and said, by the way, uh, I vowed to myself that's the last time I ever read a speech, other than if it's every public policy or something. Yeah. Then I have to make sure it's dead on. But I, as you know, I like to work through the crowd and speak a little bit extemporaneous thing. Uh, you do a great job with it. Well, I, I, John I, Borland well, was coaching me on the trail when I was running for governor here months ago, and, and continued to, to push me to, to just just use my heart, speak from the heart, not from the paper. Well, you know, I yeah. think that counts. But anyway, I was going to say. So I spoke from the paper, and I'm walking out as a senior in high school, 17 years old, and here's Joe Eric, Master Sergeant Joseph E. Eric, uh, United States Army. Okay. And uh, he grabs me and he's crying. With the highest honor I've ever received. Along with this one. He said, I, I wish you were my son. And I never thought that honor would be equal to the Lincoln Academy. Select group. I must surely be the 
lesser light, if any, of them, but to be a more of the Lincoln Academy it was a big thing. And then, in fact, I told them that when I accepted the award. That, uh, they just said, Joe Eric, you got to move over. Uh, and I never thought it would be equal in my lifetime. So all the other decorations and all the recognition. You respected it that much. Oh, sky. yeah. It goes, but it goes back to the courage thing, doing the right thing. Because when I, you thought I forgot, when I hit a fork in the road, you'll be barrel like, you know, you've got to take one. If I've taken the fork, Joe Eric would want me to take it. Everything is fine. And when I buck that and go the other way, a bloody disaster. Uh, it takes considerable effort to recover from. So, courage in the main, in the Greek thing, is the courage to do the right thing. Yep. And in my case, it's really simple. Yeah, whereas if Joe Eric would want me to do it, it's right. Uh, the fourth thing is wisdom. When I exercise in the morning and when I used to run once, I do my stretching afterwards and kind of squat down. And so when I'd also do my morning devotion. And when I pray, pray for a lot of them, but I pray a lot. And I find as I get older that I have less and less of it despite my, my prayers. But it is substitute that I've learned to ask a lot of questions. And I think that in that process that you come to have an understanding. Well, those are the four great things. So you've got justice, you've got temperance, you've got courage, you've got wisdom. And that's all great. But they're short of the mark. But, but they, they gotta look at this. Well, well I, I got four. Yeah, yeah, go, yeah, before go, I go on. Yeah. You know, wisdom, I look at, you know, I can feel wisdom I have today that I never had before, right? As I get older. It comes with age, yeah. I think, I think a lot a lot of mine has for sure. I mean, but but to me, are you saying that you No, I'm saying, I'm saying I think I, I think I'm finding out I'm not very wise, but I'm wise enough to ask a lot of questions. Yeah. And, well, and, yeah. and and in the asking of the questions, you know, Eric Hoffer, in his book, The True Believer, had a phrase that he said, wisdom is the art of discovering the known. That's more than just a tricky play on words. That's that's a, that's a pretty, in fact, that book is a riveting book. And if you haven't read The True Believer, uh, you're in for some shocking kinds of analysis. It's not an easy book. It's not an easy book at all. But the, again, you know, young leaders, there's you know, plenty of young leaders like you know in our business, my son, my yeah. daughter, and others that are in our business leading, you know, leading people. Um, you know, you can't teach wisdom, right? You, you can teach them how to ask ask a lot of questions. You can teach them how to uh, seek yeah. to understand and, and, and learn from others and uh, through others' experiences. Right? And it's it, it, you tend to find out that it's the I had a I had a senior officer tell me once. He said uh, he said uh, agree to compromise on all things except that which is central. And of course, that begs the question: well, What's central? And that requires wisdom or experience. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that said, that said, we can we can we can pursue wisdom to the end. But let me offer four more wise things uh, because I added, I think it's called the eight virtues of leadership. The, the next one is that you really need to be able to laugh at things, including yourself, because much of what we do is really funny. Uh, and, and to be able to deal with matters, George Bernard Shaw said, think of what you want to say with seriousness and then say with levity. I think humor is a wonderful uh, spice to add uh, to the circumstances that certainly can diffuse uh, tough situations. Sure. Uh, but you got to be willing to be the butt of the joke as well. And Reagan was the, good at that, wasn't he? Well, and so was John McCain. You know, he had great self-deprecating or diminishing humor. Now, a lot of it was artifice, as it was with Reagan, but uh, uh, he... 
Ronald Reagan had the, the great one-liners, and I think that that's really a mark of, of virtue. Next thing is, I think you need a faith-based relationship. I think uh, the construct of is your own with respect to your God. But uh, just go back to the prison camp. You know, often that was the only person I had to talk to you know, mm -hmm. and uh, to rely upon. And the promise of something else is a big promise. So you can you can have gradations of your faith. You can be imperfect in yours, as I am in mine. In fact, I view I view the quest for faith as kind of a lifelong quest, a lifelong journey. Uh, that's all I had for a while. Now I got into a conversation as you do on an airplane and with a lady, and I was going through this all over this business. You had only six at this point. Oh no, we had we had, we had six. At this yeah. Point. And she said, Well, you dummy you. <laughs> she said, you know, you forgot the essence of the human condition. And I looked at what I said, creation. She said, You're absolutely right. Our ability to create. Is literally the essence of the human And so we're sitting there talking about, and this is, you know, this is the creation is not that you write a book of poetry or some piece of music or, or, or you're a great painter or any of that. All of, all of that is wonderful expression, uh, the dance, uh, whatever it would be. Uh, you create if you're out there helping young people with their lives, uh, coaching the little league team, coaching the Volleyball, uh, uh, being in a, uh, I'm sorry, so sorry to see that scouting has fallen on hard times nationally. When the head of the, the guy who started Boy Scouts in the United States was from Peoria. And I don't know his name, but I, but, but he should be recognized. And I think that we, we've lost a lot. We lost the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts. I think we've just made a wrong yeah, turn. Absolutely. So, yeah. Anyway, so but creation is the essence that's the essence of the human condition of ability to create. Uh, and, and then as I'm sitting talking to her, I said, you know, I said there's another I said, and it's the only way I know how to run organizations. Some are big, some are small, lots of people under my domain, tens of thousands. I've also had just me or one other thing. And if you think back to the most wondrous thing you know, in the Army, it's company command, and, and the fighter pilot will squadron command. If it's small enough to be tidy and get big enough to be a real challenge. And the quality that I have found that endures and large units and small, just breaks down to one simple word. That means love. You gotta, you gotta love what you're doing. You gotta love the people, the good, the bad, and the ugly. You gotta let them know you love. Them. And that cheerleading kind of love, not rah, rah, rah stuff, just genuine concern for them as individuals and their families. And some of the human relations rules and regulations, you know, are so confining yeah. in terms of the human condition. They'll come up and, you know, yeah. yeah, I could do this to you. And, yeah. and, and, and she could do that to me, whoever she is. But yeah. if I grab she and do this to her, you know, you're running the risk of being offended yeah. or offensive. Sure. So, you know, and so if, if that stuff happens, then you go, well, you got to say, sorry, back off, you know, you don't do that anymore. But, you know, rather than, and, you know, ending up with, you know, yeah, you know right. something blown out of proportion. I think, I think we are a tactile people. You know, people hug, people, you know, shake hands. People, people are, yeah, but, but, and that's an expression of what I'm talking about. And love. I can remember again, at that favorite squadron, the hand, the head in the rank, the 94 squadron, the 
I was honored to be the most famous fighter squadron in the world. And find the most wonderful airplane, the F-15, brand new airplane. And some of the guys had decided they'd been in the war, they'd done all kinds of things with their families for the most part. They decided they didn't have enough deployments, they had enough and they were deciding to get out. And I can remember having one couple, Gene Eastman and his wife, wherever you are, uh, and he got out. And it's the four of us in the middle of sitting on the floor in the middle of my living room, crying our eyes out. He was one of the wonder guys, and, and he was getting out. And I didn't have the power to hold it. And, and uh, I had a, a, a couple of guys like that. I said, you know, am I such a crummy squadron commander that I can't hold you on the power of personality? I said, why don't you stay and I'll get out. You know, and they said, no, no, Mike, you don't understand. It's just, we've had enough. You know, we've been to war, we've been all over the world with you, we've done this, and the family wants us to be home more. Yeah, be home more. And, and, and but I can remember literally crying, you know, you know, forcing more than once with, as we tried to, you know, I, I guess I was putting pressure on these guys to hang. But some of them actually came back in. Later, they found out the grass was not greener. But I come back to the notion that, uh, I, I will say one more thing about that. I, we were on the road so much in that squadron. Uh, when we left, going on to Washington National War College, uh, the women got together and they got around an F-15 airplane and you could get in the back of those things. There was an empty spot where they were put electronic gear and there was a woman up there with an ironing board and a, you know, a huh. and on. There's another one with a formal on on the steps. Another one's in a bathing suit. Another one's got a flight suit on it. They're all manner of outfits, but they, these women from the squadron, the wives, are standing and they've got a banner in front of them. This was kind of a farewell picture. You know what that banner said? Call Myrna. <laughs> no, what? <laughs> That's leadership. That's leadership. Oh, That's love. And you know, and, but boy, boy, she'd fight for her family and her girl. You know, she was basically in charge when it was gone. Wow. And the girl would say, I can't get a doctor's appointment or I can't she do this. God, she'd get on the phone and she'd rip them a new one, you know, to get, you know, you take care of my lady. Yeah. And uh, so that's part of the love thing. Yeah. And they loved her. And, you know, she did that, you know, at, at, at Ramstein, when I was base commander in the place, biggest American. Conglomeration in those days outside the United States, seventy thousand Americans in the Lang Falls Valley, and uh, we're fond of saying it was too small to be a country of our own, and too large to be an insane asylum. Uh, and uh, and the, she was the leader of the uh, the officers' wives club advisory thing. But more than that, the enlisted advisors of the enlisted wives. And she had more, and she ran the big charity thing. And she had more respect and fun with the enlisted senior enlisted by. And they loved her. She was great. How could you not love her? She's she's a she's such a lovely person. Well, let me tell you what, you know, all those those, those eight those eight principles no, that you put down. Love, it, love, right, love, right. love, 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 in, it is. In, in our business, also, right? If, if we, if our teammates are passionate about what they do, they they love serving our customers. Yeah. Our customers will love us, right? If if our if our teammates are in the, you know, out there working their butts off in, in, in rainy weather, cold weather, all the things they do, I better love them. My my leaders better love these people. Our, our teammates are out there busting their butt for them every day. If we don't, we we don't deserve that, them on our that, team. It's just a strain that needs to run through the organization. At all levels, yeah. and it's it's imperfect. You know, it's, yeah, it's not a perfect love, but it's no. if they know they are cared about over and above over over and above the job. If they know they're cared about as people, mm -hmm. then, then that 
That's enough because yeah. we do a lot of cheerleading and get things going and stuff, and that's fair. That's that's a good technique, but it's the love thing is genuine. Great. And they could and they could see through it, and I can see you can see through it too in a heartbeat. Yeah, pe people will move for more money if they don't feel there's a family there. If, if they feel like they're, they're working in an organization that, that they're, they're loved by their teammates as well as their leaders, right? They're less ap apt to leave they're, even for more money. I mean, not, not just not to well, say that, that we, that, we... that's one way to, to weigh it, but we, I, I just view it as you know, in terms of performance. And, if, and when they perform well, we can pay them more than anybody else. So hopefully that 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 also is there for them. So they don't even want to leave because we can pay more and they're, they're in a family atmosphere, right? That's yeah, well, yeah, but, yeah, but the big thing is, you know, people really do like to do a good job. Yeah, of course. I mean, people are not, I don't think, out there thinking, gee, I'm going to slough off today. No. And no, they, they want to do a good no, job. Because those people for themselves. No, because those people today can stay home and make, make get a pretty good check. And, and take advantage of uh, the government in some cases, yeah. right? I mean, there's there's plenty of that out there that there didn't used to be. So those that are out there working, busting their butt in, in businesses like mine, because they love to work, because they're, they're they're not they're not work, late, work is enabling. You know that work work is enabling. That's why I'll never retire. And I'm 82. Mm -hmm. I don't think I look. Well, maybe I do look 82. I don't feel it. You know, look, you know, look 82. You don't act 82. But what's 82? I mean, it's an eight, just a number. Just a number. No, and. Uh, but, but I, I am enabled. I feel. I feel. I feel alive because of worthy work, and I think that's what everybody needs. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Absolutely. Anyway. And, and, that, and as you you love you love it in, in, in industry like ours, in industries like if you love what you do, you don't you'll never work another day in your life, and it's hard work. But if you really love it, and you get up every morning loving to go to work. You never work another day, actually. And your mind continues to work hard. I, I believe you stay younger, too. Yeah, you know, it, it is. Yeah. You know, so. That's why I write that column, The Third Degree, to keep my mind active. I love that column. Well, you know, I do it. I, I, I say that, you know, I have confidence that you can make your own life decision on matters public and private. All I do is reserve the right to once a week ask hard questions on a wow. particular subject. I like it because that's what you're, you're asking questions. You're asking tough questions on a con consistent basis, making us think, right? Instead of saying, instead of telling us instead how to preaching, think. Yeah. I'm afraid today, you know, I may have been more direct rather than just Socrates suggests the unexamined life is not worth it. So the third degree uh, is if people want to take the third degree, they can. They can subscribe. It's a cup of coffee a month. You know that. It's really expensive. Yeah. Uh, it was after a couple of years in the paper that I decided to take it to the public. And people could find the third degree online and then they'll get it on back channel email on Sunday morning. This this week was, as you remember, it was uh, talking about appreciation. Uh, it was talking about sensitivities. It was talking about uh, autumn, basically. And, and the impact of autumn on that. No, you, the, the fact the title is Indian Summer. That's right. That's right. And, 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 and it's talking about the the lack of appreciation for, for uh, the Illini, the chief Illini that we, we, we're not... The mean, chief, the fighting he, Illini. He's not there anymore, right? I mean, it didn't make well, I, I used that as an example. We got rid of him. Yeah. But we should appreciate, as you said, as you questioned, right? Should we appreciate this, the, 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 the culture that was here before? The honor, the, the bravery, yeah. the culture. In fact, in fact, I've got more comments on that article. The chief was just an example because I was using it about matters of Indian summer sensitivities. Same, everyone's so so shell shocked by yeah. you know criticism of this or making fun of that or yeah. you know. For example, I said once that I thought the Cleveland Indians, which uh, changed their name because of somebody. What are they called now? Well, I think it's the Guardians or something like that. That's terrible. But, but, uh, but and, I, and, I, and, I wanted, and I wanted to change it. Washington I just Redskins. wanted to change it to Cleveland Engines. And what, yeah, yeah, Engines. E N G I E N E S. But they didn't do it. Anyway, and what, no. And what's the Washington Redskins now? Uh, Maybe they're the Guardians. Yeah. I don't know. 
Yeah, what are they, Chris? Commanders. Commanders. Commanders, yeah. Uh, Crazy. Well, thing. yeah, the Cleveland Guardians. That's what they call the new space commanders. People, by the way, Guardians. They're not airmen or, or, you know, Army guys or, or Guardians. No, but I think this uber sensitivity to, uh, you know, here we're coming into Halloween. You better not wear a sombrero, you know, because, you know, and uh, so I know a guy, he's a Frenchman, he's going to wear a bidet. A <laughs> <laughs> <Upper> beret. <laughs> <Bidet. laughs> so, I mean, how Einstein said it best. He said there are only two infinite things in the world. The universe and human stupidity. And he said, you know, on second thought, I'm not too sure about the universe. <laughs> <laughs> so th this, this business about political correctness and cultural appropriation. Of course people appropriate. You know, we eat Mexican food, you know, we eat Chinese food, you know, we you know we we have respect for art, which you know is different. But people with yeah. the, the Dia del Muerto, the day the day of the dead, which is a thing, and there's all kinds of customs and things. And, and it is not through a lack of respect, it is because of what abundance of respect or like that people adopt things from yeah. other cultures. Right. And it's, you know, so if you want to wear a Pancho Villa mustache and run around with a sombrero yeah, and, and uh, that you're not you're not casting aspersions on, on you know, Mexicans we, at that we, point. We lost a, such a huge amount of our, our ability to to be to have humor or just or laugh or worry about it, or worry about uh, you know expressing in a humorous way anything worried about you know are we politically correct right well it's and not I, just politically correct i actually correct. don't worry about it much myself but I think yeah. some of my friends do and i'm, and I'm never going to be that person well i th i think that you know again this goes back to you can laugh at yourself along with it you know you're not you're not being derisive in any respect you are being uh as i'm trying to actually trying to demonstrate appreciation yeah. uh, for that. So I talked about Chief Illini Wick, the chief as a symbol. Uh, my dad was Red Grange's fraternity brother wow. and was at the University of Illinois when Chief Illini Wick first Did how, really? in 1926. Wow, that's, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. And, uh, and I uh, I have told the chancellor uh, of Illinois, the current chancellor, that they're doing the wrong. They've tried to figure something how to replace it with a mascot. The chief is not a mascot. The chief is a symbol. Yeah. And, you know, he wasn't one of these guys that went up and down the flight line with uh, the cheering line with cheerleaders and doing things and whipping the crowd. The chief had one purpose, and that was to come out with the band and do that dance. That, that where the, where the crowd stood, you know, with this kind of thing, and it was a sense that of people who would get a thrill, an operatic thrill. And, and in fact, the Osage, uh, which had an offshoot of the Alana, uh, the chief way back then said, this is great. He said, this is wonderful. This is a, this is a tribute to exactly. my people. Yeah. And that's what it was meant to be. Uh, so. I always thought of that when yeah, my, my sister was an Illini. Student at Illinois and an athlete there and all that. And yeah. I became an Illini fan and always looked at this as a tribute. Right? Nothing yeah, it's a tribute. Yeah, no, exactly. Well, so tell, uh, tell me about you know when you think about you know core core values in your that, that you live by. Maybe maybe early on and then today. Is there any change? Oh. At, at least a few that you a few that you think about the most, and you know, some of it might be some of these leadership these eight leadership uh, principles, but. Well, yeah, look beyond that. Or, or well, I, I, I think that it centers down to, uh, to People magazine in your life. Of those people, I think a lot about the people who have influenced and do influence me that keep me pointed correctly. And I mentioned one, uh, this guy Joe Eric. So I've had four great mentors. So I think if I had advice for young people, it would only be two things. So Eric, E-R-I-C-H. E E-H-R-I-C-H. Joseph E. Eric. E-H-R-I-C-H. You know, I tried to find him. That night I left that high school and I never saw Joe Eric again. I never said thank you. I never wrote him a note. I never did a squat. Yeah. And now I'm in North Vietnam. And all I can think about is I went to 
if I get out of here alive, besides going back to my family, I better find Jewelry. Kevin. Thank you. I spent a lot of money, a lot of time looking for Jewelry. So anyway, but he was a teacher at your school? No, he was a professor of junior ROTC. Oh. And he was, as I say, formative in my life. And I, uh, and he had a Brit wife who thought he might have gone back to England, and I tried that too, and that didn't work. Anyway, oh. uh, so, so that's sort of, so. You think stuff. you think about that person, and the other three. My dad certainly, and you know, like most young guys, I have spats with dad. You know, because wanted to be the young bull in the forest. I can remember. We lived right across the street from the high school. We grew up 700 square feet of a house. The, the uncle lived upstairs in the tent. Little tiny. My room was seven by seven. I thought it was beautifully large. The, the, the living room was like 12 by nine, you know, because I went back into the house. Sure. My dad was 100. I took him back. To the house and, oh, sold and, went yeah, to the and found my god, this place is really small. But anyway, I'm in the front room and my dad is there and Joe Eric. And I'm a senior in high school, kind of rocking and rolling with you know playing football and doing the ROTC playing with the class office and everything, national, you know, all the all the stuff you need to quote. A success, and I'm sitting there. I'm going. My dad is talking to Joe, Joe Eric, Sergeant Eric, and, and, and my dad is saying, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." You know, and, uh, and the next thing I know, I am up against the wall. Joe Eric has got me this small. He said, "I'm a sergeant, and you call me sir. You call your father sir." Yes, sir. And that was the last time I ever called my dad anything but dad or sir. Huh. You know, just the lessons of the That's smart funny. ass 17 year old. Things. Yeah, your dad and Joe are the same sure, at that yeah. point. Oh, then, yeah, yeah. So they're, they're, they're right there when I'm growing up. And then uh, after the war, well, at the academy, I had a professor, an Aristotelian Catholic professor of English. And was also a philosophy professor. And his name is uh, Mal Wakem. Malcolm Wakem, an extraordinary man. Brigadier he retired uh, as the head of the department, so he retired as Brigadier General. He still lives, he and his wife Lynn, in Colorado Springs. Uh, and I've told him that he can't die until I give him written authorization. Uh, <laughs> How old is he? He's about, he's about 92. And uh, Mal was probably the most important professor ever to be at the Air Force. He was there for class one, and he was there for 30 or 40 years, and he was uh, an ethicist. He was um, head of professional ethics for the U.S. Olympic team. He was uh, a lecturer who brought a uh, wonderful observations about life and uh, life of meaning, life of value. And I, I, I kept contact with him all the years because I wanted for him to regrade a paper that he gave me a D on. And it took me 35, 40 years to get, he finally changed it to an A minus uh, after some sort of things happened. Huh. Uh, but I see Mal whenever I go out to Colorado. I always try to see him and Lynn, uh, and just sit and talk. And he had, but he's a formative influence. And then my fourth grade mentor, uh, and a, a lot of this whole conversation, the, the people take nothing else away from it. Take this, John Gardner, the citizen of our times, according to. A former president who stood up at his memorial service in the National Cathedral, and that's how he started by saying John Gardner was a citizen of our times. This guy founded, uh, he was ex head of Carlisle, he was a World War II Navy vet, uh, confidant to every president from Eisenhower forward. Uh, 
uh, Philly died in 2002, missing terribly. Founder of the White House Fellows Program. That's how I know him because I was a White House Fellow and became close to John. We cut leadership tapes together uh, when he was a professor emeritus out of Stanford. He also you know, small things like he started independent sector and common cause. He was secretary of HEW uh, under Johnson as a Republican. Um, he was a dreamer who could think, a thinker who could write, and a writer who could action. And all of his books are worthy of reading, every one of them. But if I could recommend that I do just one, everybody ought to read this book. And it's directly what you and I talk about. The book is called On Leadership. On Leadership. And you ought to get the paper back version. You can get it on Amazon. It's out of print. But that's the one that has its latest revisions in it. And, uh, have you read it? You don't? Let me get it for you. I will, right. I will do that. Uh, and you, you will find it is the most important book. That's where I got that definition of leadership. Leadership is, an example, is a process of example and persuasion, whereby the leader and the leadership group agree to follow uh, agreed goals and objectives, or pursue goals and objectives. Uh, Good enough. At least we've got a common definition of what we're, yeah. what we're all about. So he writes about the, the tasks of leadership. And I can remember talking. I would go out to cut these tapes with John. And so we'd sit in chairs like this. And I have my film crew from Commanders. Because it went out worldwide. You know, hundreds of thousands of people. So I would have my microphone. I'd say, John, and I said, uh, Talk to me about the tasks. Tasks. And then he'd hold forth on the question. Tell about, you know, this or that. You know. and, and all I had to do was ask a couple of questions and he'd hold forth. Riveting stuff. You know, by the way, you know what the first and last task of leadership is, according to John Gardner? No. Provide hope. Provide like the first and last task of leadership is to provide hope. Now, in between, you better be demonstrating that you're making progress yeah. <laughs> toward that hope uh, or toward that express hope. But uh, it. that, that, it's, it's so simple. And uh, and then again, of course, and it, and it probably may be a nice way to, you know, we've been going here for almost, you know, two hours, but uh, I, would, I would think that. Another quote from John Gardner that is so central. In fact, you heard me use it at the SEAL dinner when I did the pledge. Yeah. And I said, you know, there's some words that are foundational to why we gather tonight at the SEAL Foundation, a thousand people in the room. And I said, there were, there, before we affirm our allegiance to our nation, I said, you know, these words. Freedom and responsibility, liberty, and duty. That's the deal. That's the deal. Love it. Don't you love it? Yeah. Yeah. I yeah so it's so simple. Cool, the boy, boy, so are you? When you read, and I'll get you that book. I'll go home tonight and order. It, make sure I get it to you in the next, you know, little while. Uh, well, I think about that freedom and responsibility as Americans, right? Oh, yeah. We need to, we need to Liberty and duty. It. That's the deal. Liberty and duty, right? And, and you think about this in business, it's kind of the same thing. We want to, we want to provide an environment where, where our teammates can feel free, right, to, to think outside the box, free to express their, their, their issues, good or bad, right, on the job, away from the job, whatever, right, to, to, to their team, to the leaders, right? And then the responsibility to, 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 to lead themselves in the most positive way with, with, with you know, accountable way, right? To serve our customers and to serve each other. I mean, it, it really, so much of this stuff plays in and, and <clears throat> together, right? Whether it's leadership in, in government, leadership in military, leadership in business, leadership in family. These, it's the same thing, right? It's all, it's all there. Yeah. But th this particular thought about Freedom and responsibility is supposed to evoke 
evoke actions that lead us on the path of continual personal and public renewal. Renewal. It's like we're we, we need to, we need to think of ourselves as tough ponies. We're all out there tough poning the pillars that hold up this experiment we call America. Yeah. And and the pillars are always fraying over time or damaged by events or people and when we we need to be tough ponies. We need to make sure that we reinforce the pillars and that boy are there, you know, if you look at out there, if you just imagine that arc or arch of America being supported by pillars, it's the education system, it's the religion, it's the sports, professional amateur, it's the economy, it's uh, honest effort. It's all the, uh, and you can go on and on. All these things leading to a, a, an amazing future for our children. I mean, that's, that's oh, hey, that's what, but every generation has got to earn its bones. Absolutely. Every generation. I mean, and we, as Ronald Reagan said, we can lose this thing in a generation yeah. or two. Yeah. I think we're frolicking with it. Yeah. We better, uh, we better wake up. Well, and we better one, take action. One, one, one hopes that, uh, and we better take action. And, I'll, and you know, business, I love doing, I love being, being a business leader. I'll continue to do that. I love being a leader of my family. I'll continue to do that. But if, if I and others like you and I don't step up to, to help lead when it comes to our, our country, we, we, need to be, we, can. we need to be covered. We may not always even be right, no. but our intent will be judged as well. Our, if the people know that, you know, your heart and your mind are in the right place. And you know, I'm not trying to give anything to anybody because right? I think you got to earn your own way. Absolutely. I don't think you can give self-esteem. You get that through accomplishment. Yeah. Especially, you know, you got to be able to match your own gun belt. You know? Yeah. And uh, well, I'll tell you what, you're you're gonna, you're an amazing friend, and I'm blessed to have you as my friend. I'm well, gonna, I you're, uh, now you're talking about what I think about you. And he's, anybody listening to this is going to be blessed to hear from you and understand who you are, and and, uh, and I hope they think a little differently about. You know why we got to continue to fight for this country. A person like you, who, who's fought for this country for fought for so many years, risked your life and, and uh, as a prisoner of war. I mean, uh, day after day for six and a half years, it was over six and a half years, right? You, uh, you, well, you, you keep did. coming back, to that, and I thank yeah, you for it's, referencing it's that to. that service. But there, there, there were and are have been, yeah, will be. Other other moments you carry, you, you know, it's all a bunch of bricks back there, and you, you know, you, you got to either you carry them around with you, you climb up on top of them, so you have the vantage point to look out and you know say, "Hey, more to do." More climb to up do. on top of them and get buried by them. Yeah. Well, all right. I, I keep trying to close up this conversation, so let me try this one. All right. And, and the question is, when do you know? How do you know? When your life's mission is complete. No. Oh yeah, you do. Well, when you yeah, when you take that last breath. When you quit breathing, yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly that. right. Yeah. So so Chris uh, Chris Chris Broadhead's been my producer through all these episodes. An amazing guy, great guy that does a great job with us and, and other podcasts as well. Um, but Chris, uh, you and I you and I like to uh, end this with uh, the Nuggets of success, the nuggets for success, the things that, things that create success in our lives. And I, I picked up on a lot of them, but what, you know, what, what'd you pick up on, Chris? Name a few things that you found were, were uh, in, in your eyes, something that if you, you'll remember and uh, take to heart and anybody else should. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that was incredible, Major General Orly. I was, uh, I, I was glad that I could type because I could type faster than I can handwrite <clears throat> because I was taking down so many uh, great nuggets of wisdom that I was really excited to share. So thank you so much for sharing your time with us, first of all. Well, you make sure you get a copy of that book, too, then. So. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd love to. That, that sounds awesome. Um, I, I loved your, your point about uh, three useless things in the military, the runway behind you, the altitude above you, and one second ago. I think those are uh, also valuable things to consider in, in every other uh, part of life as well. Um, no choice, energy and time, that's all. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. 
Um, I, I love your perspective on no one follows a tired leader. Um, that it seems so obvious, but I thought to myself, like, you know, I've never, I've never considered that, but anyone who's ever inspired me, you know, yourself included, you have a lot of energy. Like it's, you're not lethargic. You're not tired. Like there's, there's a real passion there. Um, what else? Uh, I, I love that, you know, you, there, there was kind of a through line, um, in this interview, and, and you mentioned it a, a couple of times, you know, you, you touched on how, you know, you're 82 and you're like, I'm not going to retire. Like, I don't, I don't want to, I, I feel great. You know, I don't feel 82. I'm still having a great time. People still seem to enjoy, you know, what, what I bring to the table. So uh, you specifically said to quit is to die, which I think is incredibly powerful. Um, how do you know when your life's mission is complete when you stop breathing? <laughs> that's uh, that's profound there. Um, oh, yeah, I really loved you guys uh, kind of touched on um, nuclear war, nuclear annihilation over the in the past couple decades, and it seems that the the key to avoiding nuclear war and maintaining a good uh, relationship over many decades is the same thing, and that is communication. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Having enough of them. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, wear arms control uh, at a certain point. You know, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, of course. Um, I, I love your point. You can't give self esteem, it has to be earned. I think, uh, you know, our, our current kind of uh, media needs to re examine uh, that piece of advice. You know, I, I've been around this guy for a while now, and I've grown to love him. Um, but I got to tell you, you know, a couple, couple new, new nuggets for me, right? It, it's, you know, what he, what he said to Myrna, and she said, what's next? And he said, we're going back into fighters, right? I mean, so he didn't quit. He, he, he went back, and he, and he had to be, he had to, you know, retrain to be a top gun again. And uh, what, a, what, a, what a job that had to be. He got right back on his feet and got back into it. He could have. Could have thrown in the towel at that point, taken an office job, and, and, and uh, take it easy. Instead, he went back at it. And this is what we do as leaders: you, you keep fighting. You don't, you don't, you don't let anybody beat you up and knock you down. And if if you, if you get knocked down, you're gonna get back up. And you did that. So I think that, that that's a, that's a, that's an amazing amazing thing about you and who you are as a leader. I look at also as you know, you know, leadership. What what you know, all the things the leaders do. Uh, you know, love is a big thing in my opinion. That, that, that if we can inspire. Um, people love each other. Yeah, if, if we love our, of our, love our business, we love our customers. Uh, we love our teammates. They're, 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 you know, love is going to come back to us with more business and opportunity than ever, ever. Right. And, and we're blessed that, that that continues to happen in our organization, the Rayvine group. I got to tell you, you, you said it, you know, if, if that was your most, that, that was the one you, you valued the most out of the eight. And I agree with that. Um, a lot, lastly, uh, what, uh, uh, John Gardner said, I love, you know, Leadership, leaders provide hope. If, you, if, you're, if you're not providing hope, you're really you're really not a leader. Um, leadership is about providing hope. And I, and I agree with that. And then, and then books. I, I'm going to read on leadership. And then uh, and hopefully everybody out there looks that book up. But also, got, you got to get this book, uh, you know, t Taps on the Walls by my buddy next to me, okay? Uh, so th thanks, thanks for being here. I really appreciate it. You are uh, one of my favorite people in my life, and I appreciate you. And I well, hope everybody here does as well. 